So welcome back, everyone, to episode seven of Transrational Perspectives. I am Noah Taylor. Uh, I'm Sean Bryant. Uh, today we're continuing our discussion of the many pieces, moving from peace family to peace family. We started by introducing the field of peace and conflict studies, looking at the complexity of understanding of peace and how that the different definitions and understandings of peace can vary between uh, different perceiving subjects. And we've begun to discuss larger groupings of peace, which are termed peace families. We began with the holistic interpretations of the energetic peace family, where understandings of peace are derived from harmony, such as can be found in many of the contemplative traditions. We then moved on to the dualistic notions put forward in moral understandings of peace, which through the establishment and codification of norms produce a sense of peace based on justice, which we can find present in many of the monotheistic systems of faith. We then move to the modern family of peace, which is structurally similar to the moral pieces, but relies on a, a mechanical perception of the world where the understanding of peace are based on security, such as we can see um, orienting military police and other security forces. This brings us to our topic today of the postmodern peace family. Okay, so um, so what is the postmodern peace? What is postmodernity? What is postmodernism? I think these are important questions to to start with. Um, one way I like to understand postmodernity is as a reaction to modernity. So. That brings up the questions of, well, what is modernity, which we talked about in the last uh, episode. To simplify that, I'd like to use the characters of Thomas Hobbes, uh, representing say, the nation-state of Descartes, representing the, the uh, separation of mind and body, and uh, Isaac Newton, representing uh, the scientific method and the primacy of mathematics. Postmodernity, as the name itself suggests, has something to do with modernity. And as Sean said, is often attributed to these three fundamental pillars of, of Hobbes, Descartes, and Newton. And that what marks postmodernity is a disillusionment with these grand narratives, these, these meta systems of theory that allow us to understand the past and how we came to be where we are, allows us to uh, find meaning in our life as it is, and gives us a sense of where we're going in the future. If we look at it from the, the meta-narrative as understood in a, a Christian religious sense, we're given a, an origin story of, of humanity that goes back to the, the creation of the universe and progresses all the way through to paradise that happens after death. We understand it in a more secular or modern sense is uh, envisioned by capitalism. We see an understanding of the world based on um, continually developing economic systems that have led to the ability to produce an unlimited amount of growth, whereby paradise is no longer achieved after death, but then comes to be possible in the near future. When we look at the birth of postmodernism or postmodernity, there are many different origin points or ways the story is told. Often we look at the, the formation of international relations as a discipline at the end of the Second World War with hopes that it could prevent the outbreak of future wars on that scale, and then its subsequent failure to do so, to prevent the horrors of the Second World War. And so we see in the many ways that postmodernity's story is told that it, at its core has this disillusionment and disorientation <laughs> Um, as we are removed from the sense of security that the overarching grand narratives had provided us. One way that I like to, to think about what is uh, postmodernism is to imagine these three horizons or three concentric circles. And the first being the postmodern condition, that meaning that we live in a time that is uh, marked by this criticism of the meta narratives of modernity. So that means that of criticizing the 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 state as being the logical um, unitary actor of of politics, of, of criticizing this separation of mind and body, of uh, criticizing the uh, international 
uh, global capitalist system, <clears throat> and that that this is the this is the 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 first part that was initially proposed by by Leotard of saying, well, we live in this postmodern condition, so what do we what do we do about it? And then the the second horizon, the second level, is then to have modern reactions to this postmodern condition, which is to say, well, no, that what we what we need is to double down on modernity. So to say, well, the problem isn't that our our science or technology is not um, good enough. Uh, then that is not the problem, but it's just it's not good enough. It's just it's not. We don't have the 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 formulas aren't precise enough. As the kind of argument we'll see in uh, in saying that more technology is what's going to solve climate change problems, or uh, the 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 real classic example of a modern reaction to the postmodern condition is the nuclear disarmament movement of saying that that uh, all of this 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 progress that is, we are seeing this technological advancement. This is not what we want. These are no thank you towards um, towards um, these the well meta narratives of modernity. And then the final one, the, the the third horizon, is what I would call then the postmodern reactions to the postmodern condition. So that is then postmodernism, meaning to try to react to the postmodern condition in a different way, not in re, um, perpetuating or reifying the, uh, the, the tenets of modernity, but trying to do something differently. And then that gives, brings up the question, well, what are those the characteristics that define that postmodernism, that way of doing things differently? Um, and the, the, this is that things, that things are relational, that and they're bringing it to, to the topic of peace, that a postmodern peace is relational, so it doesn't necessarily exist in some um, uh, perfect and abstract way uh, outside of ourselves, but emerges from our relationships, and that it, it, is, it is also defined by an acceptance of radical plurality, of diversity, and of, of differing viewpoints, of, of competing truths, and I think on that, particularly on that third horizon that you you mentioned, we can see that what postmodernism is is not it's not a breaking away or a, a dismissal of modernity. It is somehow interwoven with it. So we can see it more as a a twisting or a critical re- reworking of the the truths of modernity, and a, a quest to to find orientation in this devastation of meaning as we said that plurality here appears as one of the key terms and um, plurality alongside with truth. Postmodern understandings in general remain small, local, and contextual and they don't promise any final, ultimate, all-explaining truth. And so refraining from the the modern understanding of a singular truth, the postmodern approach, particularly in regards to, to peace, seeks to find truth in individual concrete human encounters at the contact boundaries uh-huh. between people. And in this, this sense of approaching reality through a, a radical sense of plurality, postmodern peace um, entails an acceptance of the vulnerability and risk and the recognition of the human condition as a perpetual process of becoming. Because we, are, we know in this per- perspective that there is no absolute truth to hold on to a truth that will transcend the, our concrete human encounters. And so when we begin to look at a postmodern understanding of peace, we find an effort to overcome this disillusionment and disorientation through a celebration of plurality and the multiple existences and understandings of peace and trying to, to safeguard that against the homogenizing force of the modern trends. Um, and we then realize that since the human condition is always imperfect, uh, transient, and insecure, attempts to make a secure peace often lead to violence. So we can see that the fears that were engendered um, in modernity between the tension of realism, um, but the fear of realism and the hope of idealism are in fact two sides of, of the same coin. 
And what a postmodern approach does is tries to help us to, remove, to move beyond the threats and promises of both of these. And so I think setting up that framework of understanding what postmodernism is, we can now look at this question of peace studies as a postmodern discipline. And I think that the frame of our inquiry here on the looking at the many pieces is evidence of the fact that um, peace and conflict studies can be understood as a postmodern discipline. I think, and this was a point that, that we started with in, in our earlier episodes of talking about the, 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 the kind of postmodern origins of, of peace studies, and that it emerges out of these, these postmodern principles of, this, of uh, relativism and of plurality and of the, the, the challenging of the meta narratives and out of the, the deeply um, traumatic experience of the Second World War, be that in, 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 in Asia or in, in Europe and in, in North America, uh, uh, and also influenced um, the, by, by other uh, intellectual trends of the time of the liberation theology coming out of Latin America, the post-colonial theory coming out of uh, uh, Africa and the Americas, and um, that com combined with the, or one of the manifestations of that in the, the peace studies world was seen in the Spanish school of peace studies, uh, um, particularly the concept of the imperfect peace or the paz imperfecta that uh, Francisco Munoz uh, put, put forward, and the idea that peace is an ongoing process, that there is not a, a final goal, but the, in the same idea of like the the twisting of modernity that 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 it's something that is on ongoing and fluid and in and in flux and i think if we look at a concept like la paz imperfecta we can see that in this breaking away from a utopian character of of a conventional peace understanding and recognizing it as an unrealistic concept of a perfect peace it, this the way this shifts our attention and our focus to uh, specific moments and situations of peace with their all too human uh, imperfections is a, is a move from looking beyond the, the level of individuals to uh, nation states, to structures, and to um, more difficult to, to define things such as culture. If we look at um, the work of Johann Galtung, he first coined this uh, terminology of structural mm. violence, which although it wasn't a, a concept that he invented, he, he did coin a term uh, that made it much easier to express a more complicated set of ideas, is that societies and things in societies can be structured in a way so that direct physical violence is not necessarily being done by a person or a group of people against another person or a group but it is in the actual structures uh, that build the society, the social, political, and economic systems that inflict violence on, on others. And where a more postmodern uh, perspective comes in is the, that later he coined the term cultural violence, which looks at the, the more amorphous um, relational aspects of violence. And the way Galtung understands cultural violence are, is those cultural beliefs that allow for the justification of violence against an individual a group. The cultural violence is that which justifies the structural and physical violence. Um, and I think that when we see this kind of uh, opening of perspective, it also reflects that there is a, a core to peace studies as a postmodern discipline that has its roots and insights from systems theory. Uh, systems theory being a, a perspective of looking at the world that focuses on relationships more than individuals and the dynamics and nature of these relationships. And one of the, the core elements of systems theory is that there are emergent properties at certain levels of relational complexity that are not present at um, more simple levels. And what this suggests is that the elements of peace and conflict can exist beyond even the, the individual, beyond the individual relationships to other individuals, but exist within the network of relationships themselves. Yeah, I, I think that, that this is a, a good moment to, to think about, again, the examples of 
postmodern peace. So what does this look like? So we already brought up the example of the nuclear disarmament movement, of this, this, this no thank you, or of maybe something like the anti-globalization movement. That's, a, again, the example that I call the modern response to the postmodern condition, or of um, uh, environmental movements. And these kinds of things, uh, the degrowth movement, of these things say, no, thank you, we're going the wrong way. We need to turn this ship around. But then it doesn't answer the question of then what is the specifically postmodern responses to the postmodern condition, ones that are embodying these characteristics that you're describing of focusing on relationships and of radical plurality. Uh, and one example that I think uh, illustrates it quite well is the the idea of restorative justice. Now, simply put, restorative justice is that when a, when there's a, a crime committed, usually a small crime, um, instead of the 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 perpetrator being taken through the criminal justice system, they try to unite the 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 perpetrator. Uh, they use different terms. I don't remember exactly what what were the recommended terms in, in restorative justice. Uh, the uh, and the so the victim of the crime and other people who were affected and other stakeholders in the community to to sit together in a circle, um, so that with the with the with the intent that everybody can witness how the events have affected each other, and then to to come up with some way to uh, to make amends for what has happened that everybody in the circle agrees to. So it could be to say, well, you know, someone had a disagreement and they broke a fence, then they say, well, I will uh, fix your fence or uh, do, do this and this, this other thing. There's going to be some horse trading about what what happens. Now, to bring it to the question of the postmodern pieces, well, what what is what is it unique to, to this and how does it fit into our paradigm that we're talking about? So the difference is instead of appealing to some kind of universal outside uh, external and objective sense of justice that is dictated in this case by the, the penal code or the, the laws of the state, that it is focused on a, a short-term uh, context-specific and relational justice. But it doesn't matter what the law says. What matters is, is there an agreement that emerges out of the relationships in the room that everybody is satisfied with and that in somehow kind of makes amends or restores um, restores harmony to this to this group of people or this this community. So, and that is uh, I think a useful way of understanding the sometimes kind of amorphous concepts of the postmodernism of of things being based on relationships rather than things and of uh, the radical plurality. Now, to, to try to to wrap it up and bring this to to a close, uh, one of the things that I do think is important as a point of reflection on this on this category, we're talking about um, postmodern pieces, and postmodern is a is a label. the the important The important thing is is to understand these pieces that or understanding of peace right, that are uh, based on uh, uh, multiple truths um, on relationships rather than things of, of relativism, of plurality, and of diversity, and of, of, of a peace that is context-specific, that is pliable, that is um, uh, relational, and emerges from the context in which it's found, rather than being sort of abstract, outside um, of the of the human realm, and so therefore the the label of it being postmodern makes most sense in our times now for people, especially the academics um, that are sort of coming up with these terms, uh, um, as as explaining it as a reaction to modernity. However, I would like to, to, to point out that 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 all uh, that all of the things we've been talking about have been 
mostly 20th and 21st century uh, phenomena, and and therefore the fall into this this experience of of you know, people on the world in the world today. Um, however, you can find examples of relative pieces, that are relational pieces, and um, pieces of multiple truths at other times in history and culture, where and therefore the the label um, of postmodern um, it doesn't really apply. It's an, an anachronism to call those postmodern pieces, but it's just a label uh, that we use to sort of simplify things to be able to talk about them. Bringing together a discussion of, of postmodern perspectives of peace, the postmodern peace family, we see that it is a, an acknowledgement of the, the diversity and plurality of truths and the, the quest of navigating that sea of multiple meanings. Um, so this adds an, a, an interesting further consideration to our, our growing uh, group of peace families where we have uh, peace as understood through harmony, peace as understood through justice, peace as understood through um, security, and peace as understood now through the plurality of truths. Um, so in our next episode, we will be uh, concluding this particular arc of the show in looking at what a transrational perspective is on peace and how do we work with these different peace families in concrete episodes of Applied Peace Work. So thank you for joining us today and um, see you next time. Bye-bye.